All right, we're going to get started here. Welcome. Thanks for everybody joining us. So we have um, almost 30 attendees. Thanks for taking time out of your mornings to join us. I'm Josh Brown. I'm the executive director of the Puget Sound Regional Council. Council. Thank you for joining us for our second virtual public meeting uh, to provide information um, and answer some of your questions about our regional aviation baseline study project. So PSRC, we're a, a long range regional planning agency that focuses on transportation, land use and economic development in uh, King, Snohomish, Pierce and Kitsap counties, the central Puget Sound region. And when we started this project a couple of years ago, funded through a, a FAA planning grant, uh, at the time, pre-COVID, we were seeing just uh, historic growth in passenger air service in the central Puget Sound region, as well as air cargo growth. And the focus of our study was helping the public and policymakers understand what are the things that we need to prepare for. So our study uh, and what you're going to learn about today uh, is really focused on both the capacity and demand that will be stressing our airports over the next 30 years between now and 2050, and also an evaluation of uh, the airport assets that we have in the Puget Sound region. It'll surprise a lot of folks that we have uh, about 30 airports in our four counties. Everybody knows SeaTac and Painfield and Boeing Field, but all of our airports play an important role. We wanted to understand uh, from a technical aspect what the um, what each of those airports can, can bring to the table. But what I want to be clear is our study as a baseline study is just that. Uh, we're not coming up with solutions. We're not making recommendations on how airports role should change. We're not a siting study. So uh, I know it's tempting to jump into the solutions and want to solve the big problems because as we'll share with you, when we look over the next 30 years as our region grows from 4.2 million people to nearly 6 million residents, roughly the size of Atlanta or the Miami metropolitan regions today, there's going to be a lot of pressure on our region's airports just to meet that population growth. Uh, but again, we're not trying to solve everything as part of our study. We're helping the public and policymakers understand the big things that we need to get right, what those challenges are, and hopefully um, helping to tee up the next uh, aspects of planning that need to be done to be able to wrestle with this really complicated issue. So let's get going. Uh, I want to hand things over to Lindsay Burgess, one of our consultants helping us on this project. And uh, Lindsay, take things away. Thank you. So really briefly, I'll just walk through what we're going to cover today. You just heard from Josh with a little overview, and then we'll move into the aviation forecast, challenges and opportunities to meeting the projected demand potential ways that we could accommodate that demand and the impacts of meeting demand. And at the end, we will have time for Q&A. And then I get to do the really fun technology moment before we start the real presentation. So you've probably not noticed that you are automatically muted. If you have any technical issues, problems, questions, please use the chat function. If you have questions for the presenters, please use Q&A. I will try to remind everyone again, but it is way easier for us to get to the questions if they're through Q&A. So um, if you want it to be answered, please use Q&A. It'll be much easier for us to track it that way. We will have a couple polls during the meeting. It's pretty self-explanatory, but just a quick run through. The polls will pop up in the main meeting screen. You'll see an option to select an answer and then click submit. If you are not using the Zoom app, that might not work for you. If that happens, the same questions are available through our online open house. The website's here on the bottom, psrc.org slash aviation dash baseline dash study dash open dash house. So we will not read that whole name every time it pops up, but we'll show you the link a few more times if you'd like to go and submit um, answers or comments that way. Finally, just a note that we are recording the meeting today. So you heard from Josh already. I will introduce now Mark and Bridget from WSP who will walk through the study. Thanks, Lindsay. Um, I'm Bridget Wehart with WSP as Lindsay mentioned. And um, we're going to be 
going over the background on the study so far. Uh, as Josh mentioned, the study is really atten attempting to get a baseline of the needs um, for all sectors of the aviation industry that includes commercial, commercial passenger, general aviation, and air cargo. Next slide. And just to get an understanding of who we have in the meeting, um, we have a, a sort of warm up question to ask you what airport do you most frequently fly in or out of? Is it SeaTac, Paint Field, King County International, or other? Um, and then just a reminder if you're participating by phone or unable to use the Zoom app, you can answer the poll questions and submit comments through our online open house. Okay. So we have uh, not a surprise, but actually we have 80%, 81% that go in and out of SeaTac. 16% um, go in and out of Payne Field, which I think is a little bit more than our last, um, our last regional workshop. And no one goes in and out of King County and one person goes in and out of another airport. So we can go to the next slide. So before we get started, Josh mentioned we've had tremendous uh, growth in the region in aviation over the last really 40 years. Um, it's originally for many years kind of mirrored the national average. So if you look at this um, slide, you see U.S. employments in blue and um, the growth uh, in SeaTac in red. And you see in recent years, SeaTac's um, growth has um, been faster than the national average. Um, and the straight line sh sh shows the average trends over that time. And you can see that there's been dips and bumps with recessions and changes in the industry and in the economy in general and travel. So um, we are currently, as you all are aware, under uh, with COVID-19, many people are staying close to home. We're having a big uh, disruption in the aviation industry at the moment. But we do want to just emphasize that this is a temporary situation. We've seen um, uh, recessions. We've seen significant dips before. And we do expect over time in the long term, which is this is looking out to 2050, that uh, the forecast trends will, will uh, remain accurate. So this is just a study overview. There were three components to the study. The first was existing conditions and constraints, looking at all of the airports in the region, what their activity levels were, market trends, and forecasts. Um, the second component was the future aviation issues analysis, where we looked at the capacity needs uh, and based on that future demand and major challenges to meeting that. Um, and then we developed scenarios to address those needs. We defined and evaluated those this spring and summer and um, identified potential next steps. So we're going to share all of that with you today. So this is the study area. And we looked at all 29 of the public use airports in the region, including uh, the military airports and the general aviation airports, as well as, of course, the major commercial um, passenger airports of uh, SeaTac and, and Payne Field and KCIA, the King County. Now I'm going to turn it to Mark Kutris, the pro uh, consultant project manager, to talk about the future forecast. 
Thank you, Bridget. Uh, good morning, everyone. Mark Kutras, Senior Aviation Planner for WSP. Uh, the aviation plays a pivotal role in the central Puget Sound region. Uh, Seattle Tacoma International Airport, as everyone knows at SeaTac, is the eighth busiest airport in the nation based on employments. And employments are defined as uh, passengers getting onto boarding an airplane versus deployments for people getting off the plane. In the central Puget Sound region also hosts major manufacturing and operations of Boeing, the largest aerospace company in the world, and also is the home base for Alaska Airlines, the fifth largest US airline by revenue in, tw in 2018. It is also the Asia connecting hub for Delta Airlines, the second largest airline in the US, and the aviation industry also supports high paying jobs and opportunities for economic development in the central Puget Sound region. The basis for any uh, project and looking into the future is the forecast. So we conducted the aviation forecast as you see on the, on the screen here, and the regional demand for passenger employments is expected to grow from 24 million in 2018 to between 49 and 56 million by 2050. And this reflects an increase between 105 and 132%. So in summary, demand for commercial passenger commercial service is basically going to double by 2050. And that's our, the region's biggest challenge. And we want to please note that this is an unconstrained forecast. This means we didn't take into account, is there airspace issues? Is there enough runways? Are there enough airports? This is uh, unconstrained just based on economics uh, for the region that uh, mirrors pretty much uh, the population growth that uh, Josh mentioned earlier. And if you want more details on the forecast, uh, you can go to the project website at the same place you logged in uh, to link to this meeting. Um, we also wanted to note that uh, we expect air cargo to grow as well by about 136% from 552,000 uh, metric tons to about 1.3 million metric tons by 2050. And we expect general aviation uh, to grow from about 1.3 million operations to 1.8 million. But again, the real issue is a huge increase in passenger commercial service demand. Next slide, please. So once we have the passengers, then we uh, analyze about the number of aircraft operations uh, taking off and landing at the airports in the region. Demand for these uh, operations in the regions are also expected to double, growing from about 438,000 in 2018 to between 800 and 900,000 operations by 2050. And this reflects an increase of between 85% and 109%. So on the screen before you shows you the aircraft operations uh, put on uh, the SeaTax uh, delay curve. And I'll describe that for you. Across the bottom, the x-axis is the annual aircraft operations as it's growing over time and the, the vertical uh, y-axis is the average annual aircraft delay in minutes per operation. And, as, and what it's showing here is as operations increase uh, and kind of where they are today, the line is relatively flat, but as you get closer to the box that we labeled projected baseline in 2050, once you start approaching those, that's when it starts increasing exponentially. And once you get past around 16 minutes uh, of uh, average delay, then FA and th th negative things start happening that people need to react to. And that's what we summarize here on the right-hand side. When, when delay starts increasing significantly, then you can expect higher ticket prices, longer waits at the security lines, more congestion getting to and from the airport and trouble finding uh, parking, and also flight delays because of either their delayed landing or there's delays taking off. So this is this kind of illustrates uh, the issues uh, in, in the Puget Sound. Next, next slide, please, thanks. So regarding the consequences, um, it's kind of a two-sided story. There's, as growth happens, that, that means more jobs and economic benefits, but on the flip side, it also means more noise and more greenhouse gases. However, 
it should be noted that noise is a very location specific issue and it's based on noise sensitive sites in relation to a specific airport and the flight paths and greenhouse gases are less so. So as capacity expands to meet the demand, the region could experience an increase in jobs and economic benefit due to this growth in aviation. However, there will be will be more noise impacts if if the if the growth in activity actually occurs where where people are living or there's noise sensitive sites, and there can be also increased uh, greenhouse gases, not in in addition to planes, but also uh, the activities of people driving or getting to the airport and the and general activities around airports. Next slide, please. Um, so Mark, before we go on, we had one question on this. Um, if FAA would impose an operational cap or have slot control once delays exceed 16 minutes on average? Yes, very good, very good question. I mean, this is what has occurred at the Washington National Airport in DC and LaGuardia and the airports around New York, that there's either the airlines decide to play nice, I'll put in air quotes, and uh, agree to schedules. So the peak demand is maintained, is um, accommodates the flights that coming in at the runways and airspace and air traffic can handle. And if not, then the FAA can come in and just, just set up a slot program like they've done at those other airports. And, and then they, and essentially it's being, the slots are sold to the highest bidder. So that, that is a possibility, but I think the region and SeaTac are working along with FAA to uh, hopefully not get to that point. All right, so let's talk a little bit more about the challenges and the opportunities that uh, we have to occur here. Next slide, please. So the topics uh, that we we're gonna that were part of the study uh, included both passenger commercial service, air cargo, and general aviation. As we mentioned, the biggest challenge is meeting the demand for the commercial service, passenger service. We also looked at air cargo, and recently nationwide, that um, it, depending on the type of airport you had, cargo has increased. If um, you don't have if if that's where uh, UPS and FedEx and the integrated carriers are based, like Memphis and Louisville, or if airports that had uh, large international passengers like JFK and SeaTac, uh, the cargo might be, be down a little bit because you don't your uh, international flights aren't happening right now or very little with, compared to last year. Um, in addition, we also looked at uh, general aviation. Air cargo is very dependent on how it's managed and it could help uh, mitigate that large gap that we have for demand for commercial service. Uh, for more details on the challenges regarding the increased demand for cargo and general aviation, again, please visit the online open house uh, that Lindsay mentioned earlier. Next slide, please. So let's focus in on uh, passenger service, which is the biggest challenge. Um, as we stated, uh, the projected demand about 55 million passengers in 2050 is roughly equivalent or the gap that to accommodate that is roughly the amount of passengers that are moving through SeaTac uh, in 2019. And the existing commercial services that we stated is at SeaTac, King County Airport or Boeing Field and Payne Field. Uh, but, but, those, but those two last airports, uh, Boeing Field and Payne are limited in their ability to expand. And as drive times increase, um, there's a lack of reliable, uh, as drive times do increase, there is a lack of the uh, ability, reliable ability to get to uh, Kipsat and Pierce counties and Eastern Shinomas and King counties. So we had analyzed drive times as well. And in the past, high speed rail has been brought up and that's actually been studied to help divert some of the uh, trips away from air travel. But it was found that a very small percentage, less than half a percent, uh, uh, would be able to accommodate the projected gap that we're talking about that's around between 22 and 27 million passengers. Next slide, please. So what are the ways we can accommodate this, the demand? On the next slide here, we looked at several scenarios and we kind of, uh, the, the three basically uh, summed it up. And uh, 
we looked at a whole range of them and we looked at um, in another way that we also looked at that is looked at other regions that had multiple airports. So like uh, the Bay Area around San Francisco and also uh, Miami and also uh, LAX. And you can see the three scenarios here. Scenario one is, uh, and we'll get to, into details here shortly, but it's basically accommodate roughly half the demand. That's kind of the baseline. And then the next was if we could accommodate 80% of the demand. And partly because of these different ranges, uh, through the various technical uh, meetings that we've had, there was a question about should the region meet all the demand or not. And so that's why we want to show the benefits and we'll get that in a little later of accommodating all of it or some of it. And lastly, the third scenario is meeting 100% of the demand or 55 million passengers. So if you can go to the next slide, please, we'll dig into these a little more. So scenario one, meeting 50 to 60% of the demand. This, bear, this baseline scenario reflects the existing commercial service capacity, as well as the plans already in place to expand SeaTac's capacity. In the baseline scenario, SeaTac would implement a range of near-term and long-term projects to increase aircraft gates from the 83 they have today to about between 105 and 113 in the future. Payne Field uh, currently has permits that allows 24 flights per day, which is the number that we used in this study. However, the airport is currently updating its master plan and could eventually accommodate more flights per day. Uh, but for the purpose of this study, we assume Payne Field maintains its current capacity. So the baseline scenario represents basically uh, it can only accommodate so many that there's a gap of between 22 and 27 million annual passenger employments that would not be met by 2050. Next slide, please. So scenario two, looking at if it, what, what would it be to accommodate 80% of the demand by 2050? This assumes, again, CTAX near-term and long-term projects. Payne Field maintains its current capacity and basically would require significant development at one or two existing airports that could accommodate basically 11 million annual passengers. And looking at other cities with multiple airports, what to give you a feel for that, that's like San Jose with two closely spaced parallels and see how packed it is, it is there, or uh, Sacramento with two widely spaced parallels with parallel runways with the terminal building and parking garages, everything in between the runways. Or it could be two airports with single runways. That could be like John Wayne there on the left and on the right is Bellingham up north from you uh, as, as examples of ways that could be accommodated the 80%. So next slide, we looked at if we, to meet 100% of the demand, again, assuming SeaTac uh, implements its near and long-term projects, Payne Field maintains its current capacity. This would require two or three existing airports um, and needing three runways. So essentially, as we said earlier, that's basically another SeaTac, or it could be a combination of two or three airports with one or two runways. To, to meet that uh, capacity need. Next slide, please. So there are several ways why, how this could be achieved. Uh, the, and again, as, as Josh said at the beginning, the purpose of this study is not to make recommendations of expanding or changing service of a specific airports, but we, we were charged with looking at only at existing airports and not at new locations. That's for another study I'm sure you heard about and to identify airports that from a technical perspective uh, meets the criteria that they have the potential to expand in the future. And that's what we'll go over next. So on this slide shows the, tech, the 10 technical criteria criterion that we actually looked at and that for potential expansion. So criteria number one, does it have the ability to accommodate uh, a nine or a seven to 9,000 foot runway and for one or parallel runways or not on, on its existing uh, uh, footprint or not. Number two, does the existing airspace have constraints or conflicts such as Rainier Mountain or it would, it would, it would conflict with SeaTac operations or military operations? Number three, impacts to uh, SeaTac uh, operations. So, we, don't, we didn't want to propose 
expanding an airport that they would fly or interfere what's happening at SeaTac. It has to be work, work well in the airspace and not to make another airport uh, operate worse. Number four, uh, flood plane, uh, flood zone hazards. Uh, we didn't want to propose an airport that's in a high flood zone hazard area because that that's that it's just it's too difficult and and isn't good for the environment anyway. And number five, ownership. So airports can are as Bridget mentioned earlier, the airports are public use, but how they're owned. Most of those airports are publicly owned. Uh, like SeaTac and, and, and Payne Field, but some airports are privately owned. Several of the general aviation airports and seaplane basins are private. And then there's also the military at, at McCord. Uh, so ownership is a big deal. Uh, public, uh, publicly owned is, is easier or less cumbersome to, to expand or add commercial service than, than private or military. Uh, number six current and future roadway and trans transit access. We looked at uh, what the drive times and the current uh, roadway access, how close they are to uh, four lane highways and whether there's train or other transit access to airports today and what the future plans are in the, uh, in the, tra in the transportation plans that are, that are done for the city. So we consider those two and, and also, how much easy, how it might not be on the plan, but if hey, if it's only two more miles away, it seems reasonable they could accommodate uh, expanding toward that. So we looked at as well. We also looked at incompatible land use uh, within a mile of a uh, proposed seven or nine thousand foot runway, and to see how densely packed are these airports. Is it open fields and open space, or is it full of residences or commercial buildings and uh, noise sensitive sites or not? So we use that as a factor. Number eight, we looked at the, build, the ability to actually accommodate additional aircraft operations. If the airport is already so busy, adding hundreds of thousands of operations for commercial service, there's basically they have to add another runway. And if, if the airport's already packed, that really doesn't work right. So that, that would be a strike against them. Um, number nine, impact to aerospace. We didn't want to, uh, some of the airports, uh, like Renton and Boeing Field and others have uh, major manufacturing going on now. And the only way to add a runway is to either relocate or impact those existing facilities. So we said that would be a negative if you're impacting aerospace manufacturing. And finally, population and employment within 60 minute drive times. We did an analysis of uh, existing and future populations employment, and as well as uh, future and uh, estimated future congestion to so look at drive times and and looked at by adding an airport. Does this include more people getting to the airport within an hour or less? And so we use that factor as well. So with that, let's go to the next slide. And so after we went through all this analysis, again, we're not making recommendations. It's strictly a technical analysis of how the uh, 20 air, 29 airports fell out in this. Um, that and. And so, as you see here, after that, at the first five criteria, the majority of the airports fell out, and four airports were determined to have the potential to be uh, to have commercial uh, service capacity in them. So we got Arlington uh, Municipal in the north, Payne Field, which we talked about already, that has some commercial service today. Then we got uh, Remington there at the west, and then Tacoma and Arrows a little further to the south. Those are the four airports that technically, with the criteria we use, had the potential of having a commercial service. If you want to learn more, you can see there at the website at the open house, you can go learn more about this. And um, for any airport to expand, it should be noted that, uh, and, and to expand and offer commercial service, there's a number of steps that airports have to go through, and that we'll touch on that at the end but it would be up to the airport and its jurisdiction to drive that process. And in conjunction, an airline has to be interested in offering that service to an airport. So there's lots of steps involved to actually get commercial service. Next slide, please. So let's talk a little bit more about impacting, what the impacts uh, would happen uh, to meeting this demand in 2050. Next slide, please. So let's talk about the environmental impacts first. So the aviation industries, uh, 
environmental impacts are, are changing quickly. Um, from the FAA side in airspace, they, uh, I'm sure many of you have heard of NextGen. They're improving the navigation systems to make the airspace more efficient and providing additional capacity. So aircraft can fly direct routes to where they're trying to go as, a, as opposed to zigzagging through VOR, VOR uh, checkpoints and waypoints in the airspace. In addition, they're working on um, approach procedures that basically a plane ended up, ends up going to idle and basically floating and coasting into an airport to reduce noise and save fuel. So that's, that's what they're working on that end. And then uh, as the second bullet says, fuel economy, not only from the airspace operations wise, but the engine manufacturers and the, and the aircraft manufacturers are working on every on new models and improving what they have from winglets to sharklets and everything else to improve the fuel economy. So the least amount of fuel is required to get people where they wanna go. In addition, the Puget Sound region is actually leading the way for studying uh, electric aircraft. Uh, WashDOT has a study they're working on that as well. So to help reduce the impacts to the environment. Um, so one thing that needs to be stated though, the environmental impacts of aviation is, is more difficult to quantify than the economic impacts, but it's no less important. Next slide, please. So talking about the fuel consumption, um, as you see on this graph, uh, since the 60s, the amount of fuel that aircraft required to fly the amount of passengers has decreased about 49%. And as, uh, as you add in more seats uh, on, on the aircraft, it actually improves even further by, by 82 cents, 82%. So consumption, fuel consumption by the engines have decreased and uh, the engine manufacturers are working tirelessly trying to get the, using different fuel types and, and improving the efficiency of how, it, how the engines work as well to help reduce us as much as possible. And it should be noted in 2015, a study was done for greenhouse gas emissions by aviation and that amounts to, to about 650,000 tons and that reflected about 2% of the total regional uh, region's emissions or, and, and where transportation uh, emissions for total was 5% of the regions. So aviation is a smaller percentage of that, but they're still working tirelessly trying to not only save money on fuel, but also to be uh, minimize impacts to the environment. And, this, and with this improving, always trying to improve and be more efficient, it's very difficult to project into the future what the, to quantify what the environmental impacts will be. Uh, next slide, please. So let's uh, turn to uh, the noise, noise side of things. Newer planes are, are getting quieter. Again, as this chart shows from the 60s of how planes used to roar back then, and you actually see the exhaust coming out of those, out of the engines in the old movies. Um, now you don't see the exhaust anymore because the, the high bypass engines they're using and they're much more cleaner, but they're also quieter. Um, there's requirements for them to get quieter uh, and they're striving to do that with every new version they have. Um, it should be noted that as um, more operations occur at airports that the uh, impacted communities might be, exp uh, might, even though the noise level is going down per aircraft because more flights are actually uh, occurring that there is, uh, they're experiencing a consistent noise level that is at lower decibels, which is still, is still, uh, it's, it's still an issue at least. And then um, it also should you know that uh, noise impacts really depend on the location. If there's no one within a mile of an airport, um, the higher noise levels are closer to the airport. So it's very, we were unable to quantify for the airports without uh, overall, but it's it's basically, it goes with, it's very location dependent on, on where the noise monitor and noise receptors are compared to where the actual airport or runways would be. So it's very, and um, yes. Next slide, please. So let's go fl flip the sides and talk about the economic, uh, 
uh, benefits, benefits to the aviation to uh, meet these uh, different scenarios. So scenario one, if we were to uh, meet 50 to 60% of the demand, that's estimated to be, be an economic uh, benefit of between four and $9 billion and between 27,000 and 61,000 jobs added. However, if we uh, accommodate 80% of the demand, this increases to 20 billion in economic activity and 135,000 jobs. And then if we met all the demand in 2050, that 55 uh, million annual uh, employments, that would be an additional 31 billion to uh, economic activity and over 200,000 added jobs. Um, and it should be noted that the economic benefit of the airport activity includes direct and indirect jobs, labor and business income are, are the, the key factors in there. Next slide, please. So this slide um, consolidates the, 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 uh, the positives, the challenges and the benefits of the, of the three scenarios. Um, the aviation industry provides economic benefits to the region and accessibility benefits to travelers. And you can see here in, in scenario one, meeting roughly 50% of the demand, that equates to between 4,600 and 5,400 uh, annual operations and involving two commercial service airports and no additional runways. This is roughly five to 24% of uh, the activity as it relates to noise and environmental impacts. And that is basically between 28 and 33 million employments being accommodated. Thus the gap or what's unmet is the 22 to 27 million employments that are kind of left on the table. And as we already stated, that's between four and 9 billion uh, economic benefits and between 27 and 61,000 added jobs. So in scenario two, where we meet 80% of the demand, that's roughly 720,000 annual aircraft operations at two to four commercial service airports and two additional runways. That's 65% increase in activity. And, and that also is related to noise and environmental impacts as well. And that basically accommodates 44 million passenger employments and leaving a gap of 11 million unmet demand of employments. And as we stated before, that's about 20 billion in added annual benefit and 135,000 added jobs. In scenario three, meeting 100% of the demand, that's about 900,000 aircraft operations at two to five commercial service airports and three additional runways. This is 106% increase in activity and which is also associated with, with increases in noise and environmental impacts as well and accommodates 55 million in past, uh, employments and no unmet demand. And finally, as we said, that's roughly $31 million uh, in benefit and 209,000 added jobs. So expanding aviation service also means increasing in environmental impacts. And as activity increases, aircraft uh, sound or noise will also increase, but it's location dependent. As our environmentalists tell us, if if a plane takes off and no one is within miles of an airport, that's not noise; it's just sound. But when it's noise and it becomes an annoyance, then it's noise. So it's very location dependent. We also acknowledge that greenhouse gas impacts are a macro concern, uh, like like climate change, as well as micro, as in adjacent communities near airports. Greenhouse gases will increase with growth in aviation activity, but quantifying it is very difficult. Aircraft and engine manufacturers continue to reduce emissions with existing engines while striving to develop new engines based on electri electricity and hydrogen. Regarding particulate matter, the major concern is usually what's called PM 2.5, which is uh, less than 2.5 microns in diameter these small particles get into the lungs and can enter your bloodstream. While elevated levels of PM 2.5 are often found near airports, it is a result of a combination of diesel vehicles and aviation fuels. It should be noted that aviation related PM 2.5 was less than 1% of the total four county region in 2019. And with that, 
let's uh, see what you think about it with a uh, poll with Bridget. Thanks. Thanks, Mark. Um, so now we want to hear from you. We have a few different poll questions and then we'll um, do so, talk about some next steps and, and go to a general Q&A and answer your questions there. So the first question we have is, um, what do you think in terms of considering the region's plans to manage growth, growing demand for aviation, what is the most important to you? Is it on time, easy to access passenger service? Is it maximizing economic benefits of the aviation industry or minimizing noise and environmental impacts of aviation? So which one of those three is most important to you? Okay, great. So now we have um, completed the poll on this one and the top choice was minimizing noise and environmental impacts of aviation. 56% of those who responded selected that as the most important consideration. The second most important for this group was on time, easy to access passenger service at 28% selected that. And then maximizing economic benefits of the aviation industry was the third choice. And that is similar to what we heard last time. Interesting. So now we can move on to the next one. We're asking the same question, but in, in uh, the opposite way. In considering the region's plans to manage growing demand for aviation, which one is least important to you? Is it on time? easy to access passenger service, maximizing economic benefits, or minimizing noise and environmental impacts, the least important. Okay, um, and you all are getting fast at this. So we have, um, and also more agreement on this one than the previous one, interestingly, that maximizing economic benefits of the aviation industry is the least important, according to 66% of the people at this meeting that responded. And then um, the second least important would be on time, easy to access passenger service at 20% and only 15% selected minimizing noise and environmental impacts as the least important. So thank you for that. We have a couple more questions. Uh, considering factors like ease of flying to a variety of destinations, economic impacts and noise and environmental impacts, should the region and choose one of these, prioritize meeting future demand for aviation, meet some but not all of the future demand for aviation, not expand capacity at all beyond current plans, or just unsure. And so just choose one. Okay, so we um, 
have a winner on this one. Most people, 46% thought that um, the region should prioritize meeting some, but not all of the future demand for aviation. The second preference was prioritizing meeting the future demand for aviation. And the third choice at 23% was not expanding capacity at all. And nobody was unsure, so that's cool. All right, I think this is our last poll question. Considering factors like ease of flying, <coughs> excuse me, to a variety of destination, economic impacts and noise and environmental impacts, as well as access to the airport, which option would you prefer? to consolidate new aviation service and the associated benefits and impacts at one airport or as few airports as possible, or disperse the new aviation service and the associated benefits and impacts at multiple airports, or don't know. Okay, so 60% thought we should disperse the new aviation service and the associated benefits impacts at multiple airports. And only 33% thought we should consolidate the new service and benefits and impacts at one airport and 7% didn't know. So well, that's interesting. Great. So now um, we're gonna talk a little bit about the timeline and the next steps and then um, get into some detailed questions and answers. Um, so Mark alluded to the fact that the next steps after this study is complete. You know, we're really trying to set a baseline of information for people to plan um, for the future aviation needs. Um, there's a lot of steps to implementing any um, scenarios or any recommendations that might come out of this. We won't be recommending any, any individual airports, but laying out some options. Um, but then those airports and those communities associated would need to take some action. In addition, the um, statewide airport system plan would need to be updated to uh, accommodate any changed plans. We need to conduct an F, uh, federal aviation administration compliant airport master plan um, with including the uh, local jurisdictions as well as FAA and WashDOT. And you'd have to, as Mark mentioned, at least uh, one airline would need to commit to serving that airport. Then FAA would determine uh, what kind of environmental review would be required, but it would likely be an environmental impact statement um, and then also uh, benefit cost analysis would need to be conducted that would comply with FAA requirements. And then there's a whole uh, neat, you know, slew of funding, financing, engineering, construction, commissioning, all of those steps that would need uh, to be done before a project would actually be in place uh, for use. So there's a lot of steps after this before anything would happen. And in terms of the project timeline for wrapping up the study, we are now, as you know, we've completed the technical work. We're sharing it with the public through these public meetings and the online open house. We have one more public meeting after this tomorrow. Uh, and then the online open house is currently live and will continue through October 19th. And, uh, you know, please encourage your friends and neighbors and colleagues to participate in that. Um, the public survey, um, which is a statistically significant scientifically completed survey, is complete. Um, we are now doing some focus group interviews to fill in, uh, to make sure we're getting full demographic representation. Those are taking place right now. Once we have all of that public input that we've just mentioned, virtual public meetings, the open house, the survey, etc. Those will all inform the final report, which will be developed this fall and winter. And then it will be shared with PSRC's board and, and put on the website this spring. 
So that's the overall timeline. And now I would like to turn this to Lindsay to lead us through questions and answers. So stopped sharing my screen so that hopefully um, you all can have a break from a slide and see some faces for a minute. So I am going to try to summarize a lot of the questions into one. Um, and we'll start with that and then move on to some specifics. I think this is probably either for Josh or Jason. And then I think probably some more technical answer from Bridget or Mark. So a lot of the questions um, seem to be really focused on noise and environmental impacts of existing systems and of potential new airports or expanded capacity. Um, so I think it would be helpful if either if Josh or Jason could kind of talk about study purpose and objectives again, and then Mark or Bridget weigh in a little bit on what that process would look like if capacity was going to be expanded or added to a new airport. You know, Bridget, you just talked about it a little bit, but more about what those environmental impact studies would look like down the road. Yeah, terrific. You know, and that's a really important question, point of clarification. I know the PSRC executive board, which is made up of all three county executives, the mayors, our largest cities in the region, our port commissioners, that's a question that's come up in this as well. I, I want to go back to my introduction, which is our study is simply a baseline study. We're not solving this problem as part of the study. We're not making recommendations to be implemented. So why is that important? We have a unconstrained forecast that the demand for air passenger service will double over the next 30 years. But that is simply an unconstrained forecast. That may not happen. In fact, I would argue if you look at the things that you have to do to make that happen, including siting new facilities, and Mark ran through how many runways you would need to bring online to be able to double that level of air service, those are not actions that we can assume are going to take place. So that's item one. Um, meeting that full demand, there's a lot of work that has to happen for that to occur, and it may not occur. Issue point two is because we're not picking how to solve this problem and we're not picking strategies to implement it to solve this problem, we don't know what types of facilities and the location of those facilities that might come online to help solve this problem over the next 30 years. So point another way, we're, we're not looking to have beyond what's already in adopted master plans at SeaTac and in Painfield, we're not looking to those two commercial facilities to solve this problem to a larger degree. Similarly, the four airports that were mentioned from a technical as aspect, Arlington, Painfield, Bremerton, and Tacoma Narrows, while they have, um, from a technical aspect, some traits that might make sense for commercial services, sponsors might determine that it doesn't make any sense for that community to pursue that option. So when it comes to noise impacts, when it comes to community impacts, when it comes to traffic, the host of things that communities are absolutely correct in being very concerned about, since we're not coming up with a solution, it's hard for us. In fact, it's impossible for us to then model what those impacts are. If we had recommendations that said X amount of growth would go to these facilities, we could then possibly go down a path of modeling, but that has to be really determined at that local level. And it's going to be the airport sponsors uh, for sites for airports that are in existence today. They're going to have to, as they update their master plans, then go through all that analysis in terms of community impacts. Similarly, if it's a greenfield site, and that's one of the things that also is out of the scope of our study, we simply evaluated the nearly 30 airports in the region today we did not look at how potential greenfield sites in any corner of the region could be part of the solution because that was out of the scope. But should a greenfield site have, uh, you know, be one of the potential options that policymakers pursue in the future, clearly there's going to have to be a lot of work done for those impacts. So I, I want to put people at ease that if you're seeing gaps in terms of what those impacts are, 
in terms of our quantitative measurements, it's because we don't have solutions or recommendations that would allow us to model those impacts. And we're really deferring to local communities to understand what, from a regional standpoint, the big challenge is, but then to um, use their master planning processes locally to, to make a determination that works for their communities. Yeah, I'm not sure what I can add to that. Um, that was very comprehensive. Yeah, very comprehensive. <laughs> Um, so just in terms of logistics, as we go through these questions, I, well, really Artie, who you all can't see typing furiously to me right now with the questions, will try to mark off questions as we answer them. If you see that your question has been marked answered and you don't feel like it was answered or you have a follow-up, please put that in the Q&A. We will try to get through as many as we can. We've got about 33 minutes left. Um, so I... We'll start with questions now. First one, um, I recall that there are restrictions to the noise factor for planes. How will you be able to control it so the planes will have silencers? Are the restrictions already lapped? So asking about existing or future restrictions on noise volume for planes. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll attempt taking that one. So. Um, for since the 80s, um, the FAA and um, and um, um, now I forget the name, the environmental uh, group in charge of all of us, and and internationally have worked at there was a stage one, two, three, and four uh, for basically getting rid of older plane, older louder planes. So in the first stage, they got rid of the 707s, the ones I talked about that. You know, that were uh, built in, in, in the 60s and earlier that you could actually see the exhaust flying out the back end and they were su they, they were loud. I mean, they're, they're super loud. Those are the first that were, were required to leave. And the next stage was the like the Boeing 727s. If you remember those, they have the three engines in the back. That was the next level. And now um, they're up to stage three and stage four is gonna happen. So uh, across the US and in the world, the, uh, the responsible agencies are pushing the airlines and uh, the manufacturers to make things always more quieter as much as possible. So besides that, I, hopefully that answers the question. Okay. Um, it's gonna feel like I'm jumping all over. There is not a tidy grouping for the rest of the questions. So what industries will grow in the coming decades that require this much flight demand? We know software and the IT industry is increasing for the last decade. Are there other industries increasing now and in the future that you see is really driving this demand? I'll try to be really brief with that. So my agency puts together the region's macroeconomic forecast. So when I cited the statistic earlier that we're projecting the region to grow from 4.2 million residents today to 5.8 million people in 2050. We, we have a high degree of confidence that we're gonna be within two to 3% of that number, maybe a hundred thousand up or down. Um, the big drivers uh, in terms of our export driven clusters, IT and software and technology are a big element of that. But you know what we've seen over the past uh, uh, 30, 40 years in our region is more and more of the job growth are service sector jobs of all types. So healthcare jobs, um, you know, architects, you know, go down the list, anything that's service sector. Thank you. Um, I think this one is probably for Jason. Can you tell us more about why you project such a small percentage of impact if we were to place more emphasis on high speed rail? So the, the numbers that we looked at, we're leveraging a study that was done at the Department of Transportation in, in Washington, and they did an ultra high speed rail analysis. And they looked at with implementation of regional rail between Seattle and Vancouver and Portland, what would the total number of passenger trips be and where would they be coming from if they're being diverted from other places? So they estimated that between 1.7 and 3 million total trips would be generated in that system. And if you look at the number of 
trips that are diverted from air. Most of those trips that are being diverted are being diverted from cars. People like the option of an hour long train ride versus a three hour long plus uh, car trip. But if you look at who's being diverted, it's just those connecting flights between those cities. And so their estimates on the number that would be diverted from air to rail with that system in place to be between, um, I want to get the numbers exactly right, mid 60s, so 65 to 135,000 trips. So we just want to put that in the context of the overall increase in demand that we would expect to see. So a gap of 22 to 27 million employments at SeaTac and then a high speed rail system that is potentially capturing tens of thousands or 100,000 overall trips in that. Thank you. Um, so I think this is for Mark, although disclaimer for all of our panelists, if I throw a question at you that is not for you, please feel free to tell me I that you're be not bashful. the right person. Sorry. So you mentioned electric aircraft briefly, but can you talk more about the emerging electric aircraft revolution, which will pick up much of the regional air travel to and from regional airports other than SeaTac? This future trend will leave SeaTac runway slots for more of the transcontinental or international flight activities. There you go. I will take a shot at this. I'm sure someone else wants to jump in too. Um, yeah, the study, the studies that have been conducted so far, uh, it does not seem practical to have electric aircraft going long range, you know, like from east coast to west coast, but more regional, um, maybe 500 miles or maybe an hour hour flight distance, just with the batteries and what they can handle. So yeah, the regional it looks like it'd be the, the regional aircraft that could do that. Um, so it's possible to have additional um, regional aircraft that are electric flying to SeaTac. So then you could go to Australia or somewhere, you know, catch the bigger flights. So it's, you know, I don't know if it will open up slots. It just may be there's, there'd be less um, greenhouse gas associated with planes coming to and from SeaTac who are connecting on the bigger flights. So I don't know if Josh or someone else wants to add to that or not. You know, our forecasts looking to the future, it's based off of what we know today. And we know that two years, five years, 15 years, there's gonna be a host of technologies. And we deal with this all the time with transportation in general, people curious about autonomous cars. And you know, if, if we have autonomous cars, does that mean we're never gonna need light rail? Well, probably not. We have to be aware of technology, the impacts both positive and negative. And as those technologies come online, get our arms around how people's behaviors are changing. Okay, uh, so you mentioned Renton and Boeing Field aerospace manufacturing impacts. This was back during the technical criteria. Uh, what about Payne Field? Yeah, I mean, I, I did mention Payne Field, though that is a major manufacturing, but they have commercial service right there. So that's the challenge that they'll be doing with the master plan that's coming up. It's like, okay, so where do you put a new terminal if they want to expand? And you're, they're going to have to reorganize or make decisions on moving stuff around to make that, if they wanted to expand it into commercial service, they'll, some, they'll have to, some challenges because it's, it's a pretty densely packed airport as it is today and not a whole lot of room to expand. So for the baseline that looked at flight paths and procedures, will those flight paths and procedures that were in place for the 70 years pre-NextGen be considered or are only the new NextGen flight paths and procedures? Um, did you look at the old way to do it or the future new way to do it? There you go. Very good question. Yeah, so we <laughs> actually have an air... Down. Yes, we had we have an airspace expert on our team who's working with FA right now uh, on the airspace issues in in the in the region, and I can also tell you that um, in the future, um, I know C, the Seattle area is on the on the on the list to be a, be part of the Metroplex, which is when FA focuses on just a region to try to figure out the best way to help it uh, be efficient and manage it and get as many planes in and out of there as possible avoiding uh, noise sensitive areas. So that, that's in the future for the area. But the, so the question is, um, our, our um, air sport, airspace expert is looking at what's happening now and he's also knows what's, what's coming as well. So 
Um, we're, re we're really focusing on making sure what we're an airport that we would look at increased uh, service would not impact SeaTac. And also by adding, looking at airports that are say near, near um, Ra Mount Rainier and others, you know, they're trying to help steer us, which airports made more sense that, that could accommodate more traffic or not and not impact or be impacted. So hopefully that, that answers your question. But with the next gen, he's aware of what, what the, what the, the flights aren't necessarily going to change a lot. It's just about how much aircraft flow and how um, efficient they can on some of those routes. So, I will, there's a the, we have a whole section on the airspace that that will be on the website in the near future. Okay. So, sorry, I'm reading and processing these real time for everybody. My brain is lagging a little bit. So looking at future growth trends in aviation, in, in projecting out the demand, was there any consideration um, considering climate change and fuel inefficiencies of aviation compared with other modes of transport travel? Um, I think this one's getting at, was there consideration that people may choose not to fly because of environmental impacts when we're looking at the forecasted demand? Right, and I, we tried to state this, but we'll say it again. This is this was an unconstrained forecast, so we did not look at at uh, anything that would constrain it. You know, if you know, if SeaTac has three runways, they can only do so much when it gets to the highest highest level. And so, we we looked at the economics and the 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 um, projected growth of of what Josh said earlier of how much the population is growing. So it was a factor. Uh, that use that and not did not put constraints on it. So whether, as, as again, as Josh said as well, whether we have to actually grow 255 million or not, you know, we don't know, but we want to, we wanted at least to analyze what would it take to do that? Well, and I think it also, we did look at, and you saw some of the analysis in terms of GHG and those kind of impacts of aviation. This was an aviation study, so that we weren't looking at, here's all the travel demands for everybody in the region and what is the best way to accommodate it. We did consider, as you saw, what um, high-speed rail could accommodate, for example, but it wasn't our charge to start with a clean slate and say, wait, maybe we shouldn't consider aviation at all. Is there a, a different way to do it? But you did see that even with something like high-speed rail, which is pretty well developed, there's limitations into what uh, it could accommodate um, in terms of the demand. The more the, the, the closer kind of regional demand is what would be accommodated for high-speed rail, um, so. So this question, I think, was partially answered by Josh. Um, the question is about the cost of health events due to emissions like fine particulate matter and noise. Um, and, you know, again, Josh talked about that we are not recommending a specific solution here, but is this something that Kind of was looked at in the study or anybody wants to briefly address well I, I just would add that it wasn't directly looked at in our study so you know we, we want to be transparent with the public and policymakers in terms of elements of our study and and what we're focusing on and what's outside of the scope it doesn't mean that those aren't important issues they are but for the purposes of our baseline study, uh, you know, there are certain areas that we're focusing on and we're being very transparent that there's other areas where we're not able to answer those questions. It uh, doesn't mean that those are, are not uh, concerns that are absolutely valid. And there's other, um, uh, there's other work going on in our state that's really, really important on this matter that um, uh, you know, I think can help provide some great information to the public. Right, so we did consider, well, we did consider the uh, environmental and community impacts to the extent we could, as Josh said, within the context of the scope. Um, we weren't 
uh, doing an environmental impact statement of a, a detailed airport siting, for example, which would allow you to really get into the, the level of detail to be very specific. So we were only able to reflect sort of general uh, qualitative or general regional kind of information that's out there. So we did reflect for PMT, for example, that there's current regional analyses that show that um, aviation pre-COVID accounted for about 1% of the total PM 2.5 in the region. There are uh, known health impacts from that. And I know that's a particularly uh, salient issue right now because of the all the wildfires that we've been suffering from. And hi, this is Ben from PSRC. I just also wanted to add one thing, as Josh mentioned, um, there are other studies going on um, in the region, and we do plan to include an appendix um, to the final report that would provide links and summarize um, findings from relevant studies so that decision makers and policymakers have access to the most um, recent information that we can find um, as part of this consolidated body of work looking at, looking at aviation and issues in the region. So that would be part of the, the final report summary as well. Okay, so put my screen share back up here. Um, do you think it will take five years for SeaTac to get back to where it was pre-COVID? Uh -huh. Very good question. This is the question that airports across the country are asking, and, and we work for a number of them. Yeah, it's, it seems to be the um, trend three to five years, three to four years is what people are uh, then the forecasters are looking at it, that if a vaccine can happen early next year and uh, can get implemented sometime next year, that people will, uh, re will be comfortable flying again. Um, majority of the flights right now are, are um, leisure, people going on vacation or going places, very little business travel right now. I've, it's been six months and I've not gone on a business trip yet. Um, so I think when that gets, uh, when that happens, it'll. If you looked at the 2008 uh, financial crunch, I mean, it took it took till 2015 to get back to where they to they were. So I think it'll be along those lines. I don't know, if Josh, if you want to add to that or. This is the most unusual past few months in terms of data collection that I've ever experienced, and and I'll give you one example um, right now, and it would surprise folks perhaps. But when we look at traffic on the region's freeways, most of our region's freeways are, are very close to pre-pandemic numbers. I think we're up to about 90% in terms of traffic volumes and delay, which it's pretty close. You know, that, that's kind of like the difference between a long weekend when, you know, folks really aren't around uh, or, or, you know, they had the day off versus, you know, a typical weekday. But if you look at transit ridership, it's it's where we see these CTAC numbers. It's dropped precipitously and, you know, very slowly coming back up. And to Mark's point, that has to do with the nature of trips. People are still having to go on their Costco run or, or pick up, you know, uh, school supplies if they can't have something delivered at home, but, you know, maybe going downtown uh, for either leisure or for work, those are, those are trips that people are putting off. So it's just, it's really hard to know really hard to know. And we're, we're going to continue to track all this data at PSRC. And at our last executive board meeting, we shared a large data set of, of all these different uh, data factors in, in the Puget Sound region. And, you know, in some cases, the numbers are uh, getting back to normal. In other cases, they're not far off from where we were uh, when the pandemic started in, in March and April in earnest. Anyone's guess, I would say. Okay, turning off my screen share. Flipping through these questions one more time. Um, Mark or Bridget, can you talk about who our airspace expert is? So, um, oh, I couldn't find my mute. Go for it, Bridget. Yeah, that's okay. It's Paul Dunholter with uh, BridgeNet. He uh, was with FAA for many years and is a uh, nationally recognized expert, um, highly recommended. So. Okay. 
I think we've gotten through all the questions. Let's give it another minute or two. Yeah, we just got a new one. Um, if anyone else has other questions, please feel free to type those in. We'll try to get through all of them. So, um, oh, so this was actually a point in chat about one of the previous questions with um, about travel volumes on the road and the plane hesitance to travel inside a confined space, which I get in the days of COVID for sure. Um, let's give folks another minute or two for any other questions. And if that's it, we can wrap up a few minutes early here. Well, and Mark, while we're waiting for that, there was an earlier question in chat and maybe you've already sort of answered it, but um, it was looking at um, that uh, efforts underway at SeaTac to move schedules away from peak hours combined with FAA slot control will allow for significantly greater capacity at SeaTac. So it's kind of a question about sort of technology and, and procedures that might allow for more uh, flights than are currently being accommodated at SeaTac in the future. Yep, I mean, th those are all techniques. I mean, part of it, you have to have an airline that agrees. I mean, everyone, if everyone wants to arrive on the East Coast, you know, at by five o'clock, well, you have to, everyone, everyone wants to leave SeaTac at a certain time. So it's, it's, a, it's a very competitive with the airlines of who has the best flight to get where they want to go. So it's hard to flatten the peaks, as it were. But if it ends up going to the slots, then FA will force the, force it to be, okay, you have you know, whatever it is, 30 flights in this hour, who's the highest bidder to, to take these and, and it forces it to go that way. So that that's the last resort. So I'm sure SeaTac and Delta, Alaska and all the other airlines will want to work so they don't get forced into that. But uh, yeah, lowering the peak. So arrivals and departures on the runways, you don't have 12 planes in a line like when, when you're Atlanta, but Atlanta has five runways. So that's that those, those, move, those move pretty fast. Um, but that's what's it's trying to lower the peaks is definitely one of the aspects of trying to improve it. Um, and then we have a financing question. So I will read the specific question, but I think probably someone can just talk more generally about how this would be financed. So if things push through, would you be issuing debt or bonds or grants available to finance the expansion? No. <laughs> So Me neither. You know, this is actually, I'm, I'm speaking on behalf of PSRC because that's just not what we do, but I think this has been a really important um, opportunity for folks to understand how, how do we even finance our, our region's airports. So, you know, as Mark mentioned, you know, the vast majority of airports in the U.S. are owned by local governments, cities, counties, ports, once in a while, a state. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, it's not local taxpayer dollars that are directly subsidizing the airport. So I'll use the Port of Seattle as an example. The Port of Seattle collects property taxes by, you know, for, by the uh, residents of, of King County. None of that property tax money is used to directly subsidize the airport. The airport is operated as if it was an independent organization. It's operated as an enterprise fund. And the way that the airport goes out and does projects, whether it's renovating a terminal, repaving the runway, they compete for federal dollars from the FAA and there are specific programs and limitations on what you can use those FAA dollars for. But when it comes to things like the terminals or parking improvements, et cetera, uh, it's user fees and it's fees on the airlines, it's fees on all of us that are flying in and out of the airport. And then where, uh, in an indirect way uh, as customers at the airport, then su subsidizing for investments at the airport. So that's that's one of the interesting factors here is that, you know, when we look at, and I think that's why it's really important why we we're stressing at the beginning, the airport sponsors are, are essential to move forward with any type of commercial air service or expansion of service. And if that airport sponsor is not supportive of that, and it's very, you know, it's it's essentially impossible to to then actually move forward with any type of commercial service. It's much more complicated when it comes to greenfield sites, but 
you know, if you look at our country, we've built one new significant airport, Denver, uh, in the past generation. I think that's just, you know, proof positive of how difficult it is to finance and move forward with the decision-making process for new facilities, new greenfield sites. Yep, 1995, that was the, the last time that new airport, big airport opened up. Yep, well said, Jones. Okay, I think I have an easy one, maybe. Um, what are the population projection numbers between now and 2050? So for the region, um, I've mentioned this a couple of times now, so I appreciate somebody's taking notes out there. We have about 4.2 million residents in the region today, and we're forecasting about 5.8 million residents in 2050. So an increase of about 1.6 million people. Um, so going back to the cost of health impacts. Um, we have a follow-up that the current estimate of costs and benefits does not include the estimate of health costs local community members pay. Should any cost or benefit be adjusted to reflect these costs? I could start and then maybe Mark can fill in, but we didn't do a full cost benefit analysis just to clarify that's a much more detailed sort of analysis. Um, we did look at the potential economic uh, benefits from jobs, both indirect, direct and induced. Um, so the health benefits is something that would be quite uh, difficult to um, analyze and it's not something that's included in the scope of this but maybe mark has something more to say in terms of that well i think we we tried to at least we we, we could not quantify it one it's it's just like the, as i stated about the noise it's very location unless you have unless you picked a site okay here's where we've decided to do 50 percent growth and here that's when as part of that study they will go very deep into the environmental impacts totally that FAA and the state and everyone will have to do um, to dig in it. But then that's site specific. You can't you cannot really do it generally. Um, so we, we tried to uh, qualify saying, yes, it will increase. We don't know by how much by and we didn't. And if like the benefits said would double because it's based on passengers. The um, it's like greenhouse gases, uh, we don't think would double because we, as I stated, every year or every next model of an aircraft or engine, it, they're improving and making it better. And plus, electrics coming on, so it'll improve. So we can't put a, we can't put our hand on something of okay in 2050 it will be this because we just don't know. We know it'll be more, but we don't know by how much. Josh, do you think I answered that well enough? Yeah, I mean, I think that's where we struggled on this uh, in terms of community impacts is the fact that since we're not providing solutions, it's hard to then quantify what those community impacts are. Um, I think the, the person who asked the question is asking a great question for policymakers, both in Olympia and in Washington, D.C., which is as part of siting of new airports or expansion, should these considerations be rolled into, um, you know, are there new approaches? I guess I would just add that you know, over time, government is constantly reviewing as part of impacts for any project in the built environment, what those impacts are. Uh, you know, a long time ago, we uh, wouldn't look at a lot of impacts that we take really seriously today. I, I'm thinking back to when I-5 was built through downtown Seattle, community impacts and what that meant and the process is very different today for a road project than when I-5 opened up in the mid 1960s. That's a good thing. And was because of pushback concern from a lot of communities. So I think if there are suggestions on, you know, to the FAA, to our federal policymakers, to our policymakers in Olympia, on things that we all need to do better, I think you should absolutely make your perspectives heard. So on that note, um, I am going to pull this screen back up with the link to our online open house. Um, I don't see any further questions, although we will keep monitoring for the next couple minutes. But 
Our online open house is up online through October 19th. And those poll questions are there, but there is also a comment box. So if you have additional input that you want to share, that is a great place to leave those comments for us. There is another virtual public meeting tomorrow, bright and early, if anybody wants to hear this presentation again. And it looks like we just got one more question. Yes, so the recording will be posted. Um, it will be posted on YouTube, but linked from the PSRC site. And we should have that up in the next couple of days or week. Um, and that will also have the YouTube capabilities for translation, since obviously we are listening in English right now. If you know any folks who want to listen in a different language, um, YouTube can do that real-time translation as well, interpretation. So. Any other questions? Hey, we really appreciate everyone spending your lunch with us. Um, again, you can leave comments for us at the online open house if you have any other thoughts that you would like to share.